Hi, this is Matt McCormick. You found my online philosophy of religion course, and this is the first lecture for the semester. Uh, my email address is mccormick at csus.edu. My website address is next on the list of those links at the bottom right. The easiest way, perhaps, instead of copying down that entire thing, is just to Google McCormick Philosophy to find me on the web. And the last address is my personal blog, provingthenegative.com. All right, so today, I, today I'd like to give you a rough overview, a picture about what we do in philosophy of religion, what these courses are dedicated to. So first question we should ask is, which God are we interested in in philosophy of religion discussions? And Western monotheistic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity have all converged on a single characterization of God, believe it or not. There's something in common for all of these folks. They have portrayed God as a singular being with no peers, an all-powerful or omnipotent being, an all-knowing being who's omniscient, an all-good being who's omnibenevolent, and a personal being with beliefs, desires, and a mind of some sort. Now, this famous picture from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel raises an important question because one of the struggles we have in clarifying our ideas about God is figuring out the extent to which God is infinite and vastly beyond our meager powers of imagination and conception and the extent to which it's possible to form a personal, direct relationship with him. We know intellectually that God is not a gray-bearded man in the sky, but what is he? we're going to try to figure that out to the best of our ability in this course. Now, why focus on just this big five omni-god, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, personal, and singular? Well, first, so many people have believed it. Historically, culturally, religiously, no other conception of God has led has had so much influence in the West. Christians, Jews, and Muslims all agree that at least these properties belong to God. And that means we're talking about billions of people worldwide. If there is such a being, it wouldn't matter. It would be a big deal. It would have a profound impact on your life. It might require you to change your behavior, your relationships, your life, treatment of others, what you do when you thought no one was looking. And if there was a being like that, it would have enormous philosophical import. And this is why philosophers have been working on this question for so many centuries. No other lesser being is as important or profound from a philosophical perspective. In fact, there's an argument to be made that you shouldn't care about anything less. No lesser being would be worthy of the name or, and I'm going to use this as a special notion, wouldn't be worthy of a religious attitude. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, God is big. J.N. Finley says, Our religious object should have an unsurpassable supremacy, uh, supremacy along all avenues, that it should tower infinitely above all other objects. So Finley's developing a concept of God as a kind of placeholder. To have a religious attitude towards something is to worship it, to view it with profound respect, reverence, awe, fear, devotion, subordination, deference, and love. So imagine that you have an attitude of respect or reverence for someone who is morally good like Martin Luther King. Um, Proportionally, if there were a being of infinite power, knowledge, and goodness, then we'd scale that attitude up and we'd have even more respect, awe, fear, devotion, subordination to a greater being. So to have a religious attitude towards anything that falls short of infinite supremacy, Finley had argued, in any regard would be idolatrous and perverse or simply foolish. That is, philosophers are wanting to know, is there this being that's out there at the end of the spectrum, a being that is that sort of ultimate being? In order for a religious attitude to be appropriate, we might argue, the being that is its object must possess those characteristics that are commensurate to that attitude. You shouldn't take on that attitude. You shouldn't call anything else God. Sort of, let's think of the term God as a kind of placeholder, like heavyweight champion of the universe. There may or may not be an existing individual occupying that role. To be qualified for the, for the job, though, a being must have the omni 
properties. Now, what other reasons might we have for studying God? Well, humans are very, very religious. So when you look at it worldwide, roughly 33% of humans on the planet are Christian. Another 20% are Muslim. 13% are Hindus. So right there, we're talking about 60 or 70% throwing the Buddhists. And we've got billions of people on the planet um, occupying those major religions. And um, the atheists or non-religious folks are in the time tiny minority. So something's going on here. In fact, look at all of these. Here's 500 more uh, lesser gods, dead gods, obscure gods, gods that people, uh, gods that have fallen out of favor, gods that people have dedicated themselves to in their lives. Human history is full of these and thousands more. So the fact that so many humans are religious, so many humans believe and so many humans dedicate themselves to this sort of activity suggests there's something big going on on here and philosophers are always always in the middle of things when there's a big question to be asked and answered okay so if we ask the general question why do people believe very often I get a list of answers like this what comes to mind is, well, they're indoctrinated or they're feeling social pressure. They've got emotional needs. Uh, believing gives them hope. It gives their life structure. Religion provides moral guidance. It's traditional. Uh, it's part of people's ethnic and cultural identity. They're afraid. Uh, maybe it's hatred, maybe it's tribalism, uh, maybe it's neurology, maybe it's somehow built into our brains or our cognitive systems to believe. It's just our history, it's our parents. Um, polling data suggests that about 75% of people end up having the religious views that their parents have. Only maybe one in four defect or change their minds. Um, a less charitable way to describe some of this might be just simply to say, well, people are brainwashed to believe. But what we're really interested in here is something different. When we ask the question in philosophy of religion, why do people believe, we don't want any of those prior answers. Those other answers amount to psychological, historical, um, neurological, causal explanations. And those are all interesting, those are all important questions, and those are all the subject of other questions courses. In a psychology class, a sociology class, a uh, literature class, or many other classes on campus, a survey of world religions, we might inquire into many more of those reasons, many more of those accounts of why people believe. But philosophers want to know what are the reasons that people believe. We want to know the grounds or the evidence for believing what is true not the causes of belief. So your parents may well have introduced you to the notion of God, but your parents also introduced you to the notion that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And the fact that your parents introduced you to that fact, it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not it's true or whether or not it's reasonable. Um, so the history or the story about how, how it is that people come to believe is not nearly as interesting to philosophers as the question of, well, are there reasons, are there arguments, is there evidence for thinking that God is real? So that's what we're after. We're asking a different sort of question. We're also interested in the concept of God. In the philosophy of religion, we're interested in the concepts, the arguments that underpin religions, beliefs, and practices. We want to know what sort of being would God be if there were one? What evidence do we have or should we look for concerning God? Is belief in God subject to ordinary standards of evidence and reasonable belief? And that leads us to this question, what's an argument? Uh, because lots of people have disagreements or arguments about God. Well, here's an important concept I want to introduce for our course, and I'm going to call it the Natural Theological Project, or many people in the history of philosophy have been engaged in something called natural theology. And what natural theolo theologians are up to is that they're trying to produce an argument for the existence of God. Now, this is to give reasons or evidence for thinking that something's true, or to give what we should call a successful argument for some proposition P. So a successful argument for P will be a set of premises or reasons that are different than P, because if you just assert the claim and use that as evidence for the claim, it's a circular argument. 
So we want to find a set of premises or reasons that are true and that when taken jointly would imply the conclusion P to a reasonable person who doesn't already believe it. That is, we want to find, we want to see if there are grounds or evidence or reasons or arguments that a reasonable person would and should accept as evidence for thinking that something's true. So a reasonable person would be rationally committed to accept the conclusion of a successful argument. And this is how we get convinced about things like smoking causes cancer, or the earth is round, or the moon orbits the earth, and any number of other facts. We get convinced on the basis of argument. Now, of course, with religious matters, people rarely hear a convincing argument and then abruptly change their mind. People are wrapped up in these issues. They're wound, they're wound very tightly about them. They're emotionally involved. They're personally involved. Um, so it rarely works uh, according to plan. But reasonable people should be prepared to change their minds when they get different information. And we're going to act as if um, that's what's going on. Typically, we strive to believe with conviction that is proportional to the quality and quantity of our evidence. So that typically, we will believe, suspend judgment, or disbelieve something. And we will do that either strongly or weakly, depending on the information, the evidence we have. And that's to say we're going to adopt something that's the jury model. We will assume that everyone is a free, rational agent capable of making a rational decision on the basis of argument. Although uh, the prospect of putting you on a jury here doesn't uh, sound very appealing, and these folks don't look very happy about it. Psychological, historical, emotional, personal, causal, and social explanations miss the point of what we're after. We want to know what's the evidence. So if Smith says, I think that our boss has a pattern of passing up qualified women and minorities for promotion, and then Jones says, well, you're just saying that because you're a woman. That's a mistake. That's a fallacy. That's called the ad hominem fallacy. It's the mistake of attacking the person instead of addressing the argument or reasons that have been given for a conclusion. So what we're after are, what are Smith's reasons for thinking that the boss has a pattern of passing out qualified women and minorities for promotion? The fact that Smith is a woman is irrelevant to whether or not the boss is actually doing that. So the fact that somebody was raised Catholic is irrelevant to the question of whether or not God's real and whether or not there's good reasons for thinking God is real. Or the fact that someone maybe has um, some emo emotional investment in their belief in God is irrelevant to the question of whether it's true and whether it's reasonable. So we're going to leave out psychological, historical, emotional, personal, and causal explanations for people's religious beliefs when we ask why are people religious. Okay, so uh, coming at the question from another angle, why is it important? It's probably pretty obvious why it's important. Uh, the question of whether or not God exists and what to think about lots of religious matters. Well, look, you might be wasting your life, your time, your money, your education, your career if you've got the answer wrong or you're being unreasonable about this. There's people out there who are prepared to kill you for not believing the right thing. That's incentive to get this thing cleared up. It could not make the difference between eternal life and infinite reward or eternal punishment. There's that too. You're not a mindless sheep. And then what you believe about God or what your religious views are affects who, you, who people vote for, which laws they pass, who they marry, who they'll bomb, who goes to prison, which wars they fight, how they live, and little things like the future of the human race. It really does matter. It figures so largely in people's mindset and belief structure about the way they, uh, they live. And um, the... the as members of a society where what you believe and what I believe, it has an effect on each other as voters, as people who have their kids in the same school, as people who share roads, who share projects, who uh, 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 make plans as a nation, as a people, as a humanity. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a huge question is a huge matter. It's a matter of, matter of huge importance. We are surrounded by, furthermore, people who are trying to convince us of religious claims. So we need to get clear on some of the big important issues. Okay, so um, I can make uh, a graphic representation of the way philosophers come at this thing. So lots of people believe that God exists. The vast majority of people believe that God exists. And historically, the arguments for God's existence have fallen into roughly three families of arguments. Cosmological arguments, teleological arguments, and ontological arguments. 
Uh, in this course, we're going to focus on and look at some prime uh, recent examples of cosmological and teleological arguments. And I'll show you some of those. And as soon as you hear this reasoning, it'll sound familiar because you've heard this before. Um, people also obviously draw on miracle ideas to uh, uh, fortify or uh, as evidence as part of their belief in God. And I'm going to call, generally speaking, those four families or those four approaches evidentialism or natural theological approaches to God's existence. But there's also a, um, a, a group, uh, a set of families of approaches that I'm going to call non-evidentialism, and these include pragmatic justifications for believing in God, faith justifications for believing in God, and something called reformed epistemology. So roughly speaking, there's your taxonomy of some of the big uh, approaches and the way that all lays out, and then there's this thing, the problem of evil, natural and moral. And what I mean by that is that there is, whether we like it or not, there is the appearance of, there's widespread uh, suffering on the planet among sentient beings. And much of that suffering looks to be pointless or doesn't look to be perfectly easily compatible with the notion that an infinitely powerful, knowing, and good God who loves us is out there watching over us. So the classic problem that has um, dominated religious discussions for centuries, for, two, for over 2,000 years, has been uh, why if there is one of those beings, if there is an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing God, out there, then why is there so much suffering? So that's called the problem of evil, and it subdivides into a lot of interesting uh, categories and discussions, but it subdivides into that, the natural and the moral problem of evil. And we're going to talk about those because that serves as a kind of obstacle to uh, theism, to belief in God. And it's not to say it defeats it, but um, it has been historically a very important discussion, and we're going to look at some of the details there. Okay, so there's also routes uh, we can categorize or come up with a taxonomy of routes to disbelief. That is, there's people out there, admittedly in the minority, who think that there's no God, and we can lump them into deductive atheology. And these folks have argued um, there's a literature and philosophy, uh, books and articles, arguments historically, that have argued that the concept of God is incoherent or meaningless, or they've argued that there's something contradictory about um, the way God is characterized. There's inductive atheology. There's people arguing that, that we have good reasons to think that God's existence is improbable. One of those, uh, for instance, is that evil, the existence of suffering, makes God's existence unlikely or unreasonable to believe. There's people out there who um, maintain that we ought to be atheists by default, that without substantial proof, one should not believe. So the default position is to not believe or to disbelieve. There's naturalists out there who maintain that science fan, finds natural explanations for everything. And they'll go further and say that all, the all and only facts in the universe are natural facts, um, or that the only sorts of entities and the things that exist are spatial, temporal, um, uh, natural objects. And God, of course, as a, an alleged supernatural being, would be beyond that. And, and science, they maintain, naturalists maintain, science has shown us for a variety of reasons that only natural objects exist. And there's people out there arguing for something that I've called the Santa principle. That is, we can prove or we should reasonably conclude that God doesn't exist on the same sort of grounds that we think that there's no Santa. All right, so there's a rough, uh, a very, uh, an initial taxonomy of different kinds of uh, disbelieving arguments or atheistic arguments. And then there's agnostics. There's people in the middle. There's the fence sitters, the ones who are not sure. And we can divide them into two groups. There's people who um, we, we might just say of them that the jury is still out. Somebody might just say, I've considered the evidence, but I do not find either set of arguments compelling. So this person just says, I'm not sure. It's a perfectly reasonable and common position. And another view is a bit stronger. It's a bit more prescriptive is somebody who says God's existence is something that cannot be known in principle. So it's not something that we can form a rational conclusion about. All right. Now there's a number of other topics that we're going to discuss in this course, including faith. Um, what role does faith have? Is it okay or permissible? Or does it make sense to believe in the face of uh, contra uh, contradictory evidence or inadequate ev evidence? What's the relationship between science and religion? What attitude should we take about there, the way those two uh, enterprises work? Um, what's the relationship or what's the nature of morality in religion? Is God necessary for morality? We also want to know about the afterlife or about immortality, what happens after we die, if anything. 
So, in conclusion, We've seen it's important to study the notion of an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God for a number of reasons. I'm going to call that the omni-God. Philosophy of religion, the way we do it um, in uh, the analytic, analytic tradition, focuses on arguments for and against belief, not on the social, psychological, historical, or cultural descriptions of religion. Those are uh, perfectly legitimate and suitable topics, but those are for other departments and other courses. We should be prepared to listen to the reasons and make an informed decisions. And we will consider a number of the most important arguments and related issues to God in this course. So let's get started with all of that.